Thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here. Um, I am Marcelo. Uh, I've already been introduced, and uh, I had the guidance of my master thesis supervisor, Natalia Ms. Leitão, on the development of a minimal runtime overhead metallurgy protocol for Julia, and that's a big title. Okay, so it all begins with uh, metallurgy protocols. We're all familiar why, why they're good. They allow us to extend uh, the semantics of a programming language without uh, actually having to dig into the internals of the language. And uh, on a side topic, uh, ult um, in the, um, the last times, we've seen uh, many developers moving on to dynamic languages with uh, plenty of abstractions uh, because they're convenient, right? So they, they make our jobs a lot easier. Uh, but then again, uh, all these abstractions come at a cost, right? And uh, in, in the example of the scientific community with the big numbers, big data, et cetera, uh, performance becomes important, right? And there are several alternatives which uh, these developers uh, resort to. For example, they create libraries which resort on, which uh, rely on faster languages. For example, NumPy, which uh, calls C code. Um, we have, uh, for example, writing more efficient uh, compiler or interpreter implementations, which for the case of Python, we have PyPy and Numba, as someone suggested here in the conference. Uh, and then there's also the alternative of, well, we prototype the solution in, in these languages, and then eventually we'll just rewrite them in C, C++, or Fortran. Well, this one is the most popular alternative in the scientific community, but we can all agree that it's um, tougher to actually go through because while well, we're writing in two languages and it's more work, more time, etc. And so to solve this issue, we have a language somewhat similar to Python, which was development, which was developed quite recently, called Julia, which is very familiar in syntax and uh, in features. Um, and it also has uh, some similarities to common lists. For example, there is the concept of generic functions and methods. We also have multiple dispatch, which we don't find in many languages nowadays. And um, it, it also has a some of a disadvantage, which is it has a very basic object system. So if we look at Python, Java, etc., we have a very complete uh, object-oriented system. If we look at Julia, we have something which is more similar to C. So you have structures, and then we have supertypes. But these supertypes all have to be abstract, so it's quite limited. But because of this, Julia ends up being a lot more efficient than other languages. If you compare Python with Julia, we see that Julia is way, way faster. In, in fact, it, uh, it even ends up being quite similar in performance uh, with C and C++. Okay, so now I'll actually compare very briefly uh, two implementations of meta-object protocols. Right? We're all familiar with the one in the clause map. Right, where we have meta objects, uh, meta classes, and uh, this ends up being somewhat of an issue if we look in terms of performance, right? Because we have all this data that lives in the runtime, right? And then if if you want to uh, extend the semantics, well, this uh, sort this extension somewhat has to be seen, right? So when you call a method, there's another method that's going to be called, passing the meta objects, the meta classes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and this consumes time. Right, uh, and uh, then we have Open C++, which looks at this issue and thinks, okay, how can we do this differently? Right, so we have all these meta objects, right, and this impacts performance. So their idea was, okay, what if we move all these meta objects, meta classes, etc., to compile time, and then at runtime, none of this exists, right? So we sort of have the same flexibility. But we don't have no we don't have any impact in performance. Uh, but uh, this um, sort of has an issue, right? So if we're moving everything to compile time, this means that we can no longer <coughs> extend the semantics in runtime, right? And so this is sort of an issue. This uh, this kind of creates a dilemma between the two implementations, which we'll explore later. And so uh, right now, I want to um, talk about a couple of features. Uh, which will be relevant in the implementation of a meta object protocol in Julia, because we want to take advantage of all these new performance innovations that the developers implemented. And so the first one, which I find uh, very interesting, is method specialization. So over there we see um, g of x is equal to x plus one, a very simple method. 
And uh, it's quite generic. So we didn't define the type of X. We just pass it something and hopefully the program will go fine. And uh, in Julia, we have a very interesting macro called code LVM, which will basically output us the low level, low level ish assembly that uh, Julia generates for a specific method call. Right, so this looks quite scary, but uh, the only thing that we need to know is that, okay, if we pass an integer to the function g, right, uh, we just get some assembly. We see an i64, which probably is integer of 64 bits, etc., and then it just returns one, right? Well, it returns the one plus the value supplied. And then if we call this with the float, well, we don't need to know what this means, right? But we know that it's different. So in Julia, if we pass different argument types to a function at runtime, it compiles um, a new method uh, specifically for the type, right? So this makes sure that uh, whenever uh, we have some generic code, we, uh, we write the code more in a generic way because it's, well, it's more convenient, right? And Julia takes care of the part of optimizing it to the max for the type of argument supplied. And uh, the next interesting feature is method redefinition. It's not super, super interesting if we just uh, look at it as it is, right? But it allows us to explore a better idea of what it means for data to be mutable slash immutable, right? So we just define function x, which returns 1, right? And we just re redefine it again. Instead of 1, it's now 2. And so this allows us to look at, um, it's instead of just having mutable, immutable data, we have something in the middle, you know, because defining a function x, and at least in the eyes of Julia, is much different than, than, than defining a global variable x, right? Because if we have a global variable, right, it's variable, so it's not constant. And because it's not constant, it's more difficult to actually extract the most performance out of it. While if we have a function which just returns a constant, well, Julia looks at it and thinks, okay, this is, this is never going to change, so I can optimize this to the max, right? So if we have a function y which calls x and then sums a value to it, it knows that x is always going to be 1. But then again, if we redefine it, well, things become a bit complicated, except they don't become complicated. So when, when you redefine a method, all the methods that call this method will also be recompiled, right? So if we have a big chain of methods, uh, all of them def uh, depending on each other, if I, do, if I redefine the one at the end, everything is going to be redefined, and it's going to be the most optimized version, version that it can be, right? And so we look at this problem of clause versus open C++, right? We have the most uh, flexibility, expressiveness in clause, where, where we can just change everything at runtime. And then we have the space of open C++, where you, we don't def redefine anything at runtime. It's as it is. And so we'll try to uh, implement something that's in between, right? That explores the ideas of compiling everything and then getting rid of all the meta objects in the middle and also being able to redefine things at runtime. And so let's have a look at our solution in Julia. Uh, we, we, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the object system is very basic. <coughs> there is super types, uh, uh, only abstract and the, there, there is also in Julia by default no multiple supertyping. So in Julia, a type can only have one supertype. So if we want to have a good object system, well, good, but that <laughs> depends. Well, if we want to have a, a, an object system similar to class, we must have multiple inheritance, right? So we must first handle that. And so this is a very simple classical example of the diamond inheritance, right? We uh, define the macro def class, which allows us to define classes in our system. This is all in Julia, by the way. Define class A, B, which inherits from A, C, from A, D, B, C, etc. And so what this macro does is first um, make sure that the following things exist. It creates a Julia structure. And uh, also it's um, good to note that uh, in Julia, structs are not redefinable. So once you define a struct, it's set for life. Well, at least for the lifetime of the runtime. And it sets an abstract type for the class. Right? Uh, so in the previous example, 
where we have f class A, it defines a structure for that, and it also defines an abstract type. I'll be uh, more specific in the difference of the abstract type and the structure in just a second. And so it defines a default constructor, as well if we have a class, we want to have instances. It defines a class of method so that we have uh, this, uh, so that we have a relation between the instances and the class itself. We define the superclass method to, gives a, to give us uh, a relationship between a class and their superclasses. And we define the prec list, with, which uh, gives us the precedence list. And uh, if we look at the examples of all, all of this, we see that uh, we can instantiate A like that. We can see the class of small a, which is big A. We can also see that uh, the type of, and here type of is an actual default Julia method to get us the type of a thing, right? And we see that A, in this case, is an actual data type of Julia. So in Julia, uh, types are, I think that's how you call them as first class citizens. So you can uh, pass them in arguments, assign them to variables, etc. And then we have superclasses. So A was not defined with any superclasses. So by default, we have any, which is the type in Julia for, um, which is the super type of everything. This would be equivalent to uh, common lists T, if I'm not mistaken. And um, if, we if we create an instance of D and see that it's superclasses, we see B and C. And here, this is, uh, it's important to note that here we use methods for everything because we want Julia to be able to optimize everything, right? So instead of storing this information in global variables, we define methods for these things. And then we also have precedence list, which gives us topological sorts of the these class hierarchy. Okay, uh, so we also have slot definitions. That's pretty basic and if we have an object system we want to have slots we want to hold data right and then we have class redefinition but i did say that by default julia doesn't allow us to redefine structs so maybe this means that uh, for our system we cannot use structs right so we first define x which has a slot a we create an instance x1 and then we redefine x and add one slot to it and then uh, we also create x2, which is an, an, an instance with the new version of the class. And then if we look at class of both x1 and x2, we see that they're both x, right? Which makes sense, right? We redefine the class, but the previous one is, well, it's still an x. It's still as valid as the other one. And so if we look at uh, the slot b of x2, we see that we have two. And then we see that uh, if we try to access b from x1, well, we have an error. And it's, well, it's valid that we have an error. Uh, that's how we defined it, uh, but uh, we see that type xv1 has no field b. Well, xv1, we didn't define any of that. So let's actually see, oh, actually, not now, but later, see what, what's happening. And um, here we also uh, implement the slot inheritance. So as I said earlier, in Julia, you can only instantiate um, the, how do you say, the bottom of the hierarchy, right? So the types which are above are all abstract types. And here having slot inheritance, well, we can just say we have A with A slot A, and then we can instantiate A, we can have subclasses of A, which also have other slots and everything is instantiable, right? As opposed to things go traditionally in Julia. And so actually looking inside dev class and uh, being more specific with the example of the struct of the structs and the abstract type, when we define, when we first define um, A, right, we see that what happens is we define in, in the top right corner, we define an abstract type A, right? It's just abstract. It means that eventually something might be a subtype of this, right? And uh, for the first line over there on the left, we create the abstract type, and then we create a structure, version one. Because well, we can if since we cannot redefine the structure, let's define the first version of it. Right. And so we define a structure a v one, which is a subtype of a, meaning that anything that takes an a will also take an a v one, right? So this is how we you know go around this limitation of Julia. And then when we redefine a, we get a v two, 
right? And this is why when we tried to access B in X1, which was an instance of the first version of A, it ended up in an error because, well, it doesn't exist. So we give the programmer the responsibility of um, handling what happens when you try to access stuff that doesn't exist. Can I ask you something? Yes. Um, what happens if, if you define a class, redefine it, and then redefine it again to get back to the original definition? Is ah. this going to be yet another struct, or is this going to be... It is, a yes. So we're get, in this example, we'd have uh, an A, V3, which with uh, the same slots as A. And if uh, we try to access, we try to uh, get uh, new code to access only A, it's going to be both valid for V1, V2, and V3. But this is a different structure. Yeah, it's a different structure, yes. Yep. What happens if we define use def plus a underscore underscore v1? Uh, <laughs> I was hoping no one noticed that. Uh, Don't forget to repeat the question. Uh, sorry, sorry. So the the uh, first question was what will happen if uh, we redefined uh, a with the same slots as the first version? Yes, uh, we would have uh, a class a uh, the structure a v3. So it would still be have the same slots, but it would be a new structure. And the uh, second question was, what would happen if we called it if we said that class a underscore underscore v1? Okay. So what would happen is uh, if if we didn't beforehand uh, define a class a, everything would go all right, and then the underlying structures would be a underscore underscore v1 underscore underscore v1 and so on and so forth. Yeah. It's a uh, limitation that uh, we didn't really bother to go around. Yeah. Okay, and uh, for the for the next thing, we have method dispatch because well, since uh, in Julia we don't have multiple inheritance, we actually have to find a way of well implementing it right because uh, by default it doesn't work, and so um, we have a, a new macro def method. And uh, for this example, we define a method bar, which takes an argument a of type a, and the only thing it does is return zero. And uh, if we call bar with d, we see that it works, right? Because, well, d is a subclass of a, right? And then if we define bar, taking arguments as b, returning one, and then also for c, we see that um, everything is fine, everything makes sense. If we did this same thing in a common list, we'd have the same result, right? Um, and so this is how we, well, so we implemented multiple inheritance uh, method dispatch. And so the def method macro has uh, two main tasks. It uh, stores the method body somewhere. And uh, the way we do it is then again with method calls. So we create a method that's going to have the set of method bodies available for this, uh, for this uh, generic function, right? So for this example, we defined bar three times, so we'd have uh, three different method bodies, right? Each one returning zero, one, and two. And then we create slash redefine the method computer. And so what is the method computer? The method computer is the thing that's responsible for handling the dispatch, right? So more specifically speaking, when we define bar and then we call bar, Right. This call to bar is the call to the method computer. All right. And uh, how is it? What time? Oof. Okay. And so the method computer, it gathers the types of the arguments. It gets a list of methods whose uh, argument types are compatible with the parameter types. It then sorts this uh, list of methods uh, to get the most specific one. And then it calls the most specific method, passing the argument supplied and then returning its return value. Uh, on a side note, we also define method combinations, which uh, were uh, approached on the previous uh, lecture, what lecture, no, presentation. And uh, for a quick example, we define a method foo taking d, and this is the primary method. So if we call foo with an instance of d, we see that we get printed primary method. And then if we try to extend this method with the method combinations, we define a before method, which just prints calling before. And then the, an after method, which prints calling after. And then if we call foo again with another instance of D, we see that this all gets chained up into just the final method. Uh, yeah. 
We also implemented a very basic uh, protocol for make instance. So we follow the, um, the same strategy as common list. So by default, a class has a meta class standard class, right? And uh, for this uh, example, we define a class special class, which is a subclass of standard class, right? And then we define a class A, which has as meta class special class. And then by default, in our implementation, we have a make instance method, which takes the class meta object as the first argument, and then it's arguments for actually instantiating. And so if we define a, a before method, right, uh, for a special class, where, which just prints creating an instance of and then the class passed, we do this for special class. And then if we instantiate a class, we see that it actually goes with the before one, calling the protocol, creating an instance of A, which is the class supplied, and then it returns us an instance of that. Okay, so regarding the evaluation, because this is the, the important thing, this is the motivation, right? Because if we see that Julia has all of these uh, performance benefits, do they actually show up when we implement this? And so for the first part, we have method dispatch, right? Uh, when we create a method bar for A, right? And then we call we call it with an instance of D, right? Well, first of all, if you recall uh, regarding the method computer, right? It has to get the, um, the types of the arguments. It has to get the list of methods defined. It has to do all of this sorting. And then at the end, it actually calls it, right? We see that uh, we have three implementations, right? Of bar, one for A, one for B, and one for C. And so there is a lot of computation involved, right? And so if we... Uh, if we try to see the assembly generated for the last method call, right, bar D, we should expect more things to show up. But as we see, uh, taking uh, also Julia's, um, how do I say, uh, optimization of uh, argument type, we see that uh, all of these computations, right, of the method computer, all there are computations which involve type. And so if you're generating a specific version of bar for a specific type, which would be D, right? Julie knows that all of these computations which deal with a dispatch are always going to be the same for the same argument type, right? So it is smart enough to do all of these computations. And then when it compiles the, the version of bar specific for D, it just returns one because that's the method body of the, the call for B, which is the correct one. And so we had all of, the, all of these mechanisms, right, which are, can be quite complex depending on how big the tree is. And Julia is smart enough to boil all this down to just the method body, which is quite interesting. And so if we look at method combinations, right, method combination is also another thing that the method computer has to do, right? So after everything that we did, right, so handling dispatch, we then have to uh, join all of these methods together, right? some before others, etc. And then if we look at the assembly, well, this assembly is a bit more complicated, so I just uh, did some high-level code of what the assembly shows. And even though we have uh, all of these mechanisms in place, the resulting assembly is only print line. It's only what matters with these methods. So there is no overhead involved. And then uh, we did a very tiny benchmark uh, comparing method dispatch with clause. Uh, we had an example of um, a very simple method doing a very simple arithmetic operation. And then we called this method 10 million times. And this was for, again, then again, the same diamond hierarchy, right? So there would be some computation involved. And we saw that for clause, even with uh, type annotations to get, to get the most performance out of it, we saw that our Julia implementation was uh, quite a bit faster. Uh, so it, this, it, it's only a small example, but it's, uh, it's not super substantial, but it shows that uh, even with uh, this uh, small implementation in mind, we can get you know, a faster result. So uh, taking this into account for the future, maybe we, uh, we get to uh, uh, implement a more expressive meta object protocol for Julia, one that can be, you know, a bit closer to clause because currently it's there is still a lot to be implemented. Uh, it's in no way uh, a rival for clause, but uh, 
I don't know, like the future seems a bit optimistic. And uh, if someone decides to pick up this project uh, after I finish my thesis, maybe we can get uh, a faster implementation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, when you define before and after methods, uh, you used a special double column syntax. Yes. Is that of your own choosing, or is it a, is there a limitation in syntactically speaking in Julia? Because if you do it like this, you can only have one qualifier for every method. Uh, one qualifier for every method. Uh, yes. So, uh, so the question is uh, uh, regarding the the notation for before and after <laughs> methods. Uh, it's not a limitation of Julia. It's just um, something that I chose. It looked cool, I suppose. It, uh, lo <laughs> it looked similar to other constructs in Julia. Uh, but yes, so you can only define one. Yeah, that is correct. But it's not uh, it's not impossible to define multiple qualifiers. Yeah, it's the one that I chose. Did you implement call next method, and how does it behave with LVM? So call next method. Uh, this uh, is more uh, is talked in more detail in the paper, and uh, call next method. So it's actually uh, interesting. So uh, for this one, so the the method computer, it uh, finds a way of chaining all of these. Um, uh, how are they called? The secondary methods? Is that how it's called? Effective. So so the thing that so the the pieces for the effective method, right? We have the before, after, etc. Right? And so the method computer basically uh chains uh it, it creates a bunch of lambda functions right which chain which chain themselves and well for, for an obvious reason i didn't put it in this presentation because it's a bit complicated for me to, to explain it right but uh it chains all of these methods right and then uh so the the method uh the methods are actually defined with uh two extra arguments two two extra parameters actually so one of them is call next method which is so, so the function is passed. So when you call call next method, it knows which function it's going to call. And then it, it has also has next method, which is the parameter which tells you, well, if you call it, it's going to tell you, do we have an next method or not? Can we advance or not? Yeah, it's more in detail on the paper. Yes. This is more a question about uh, cross pollination between like Julia and other Lisp dialects. I, I just wondered the first code example you showed. Did a, you did a kind of a disassembly, whereas in columnist, for example, you would give the name of the function disassemble, whereas you gave a function call with an actual argument, and columnist would see generic arithmetic, and Julia would see machine arithmetic for the concrete type. So I, I just think that this is like a completely earth shattering feature of Julia. And I really wonder if other, like when you show that kind of example to people from other corners of the list world, do you think they understand how amazing that is? Or does it just kind of uh, go along? Uh, so the question is, actually, I don't really know how that translates to the question, uh, but... Uh, I, mean, I think you illustrated the, the Julia compilation model. And yeah. I, I just wonder, do, you, do other, when you show that kind of example, do you think that people using other lists understand the significance of the Julia compilation model with the way that it propagates types and that kind of thing? Uh, right, so asking if the, in the list community people know how Julia's compilation method, uh, the compilation uh, style. I'll go that. Uh, actually, I, I don't know. Uh, w for me, when I started exploring this, uh, it seemed like a huge thing. Uh, I really didn't know how not everyone was talking about it, right? Uh, <laughs> when, when Julia people present it, it seems, it seems to be very casually low key. It's not like yeah. a mic drop, which it should be kind of. Like. Exactly, yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> Me, I, I don't know. Like it, to me, especially for my thesis, when I found out to this thing, like it seemed like a very big deal. Uh, but uh, regarding other communities and other languages, I don't know how people see this actually. So I think uh, if we keep it short, we can. Yes, it's, it's, it's just a follow-up question to the previous yeah. one. So I'm curious, when you started your project, was this already kind of like the hypothesis that Julia would be able to optimize so way? Was this also like a something that you discovered after you did the evaluation and you were surprised by it just yourself? Um, okay, so the question is uh, regarding uh, regarding all of this, right? If we already had in mind that Julia was capable of doing this. Uh, no, we didn't. So so this was a project uh, defined by my professor, right? And I, I took on it. And uh, 
basically, optimistically speaking, we thought that maybe Julia was capable of burning some overhead, right? So uh, when I was exploring some solutions with this, uh, and uh, also some lower level, you know, Julia mechanisms with uh, with the compilation. Uh, it seemed to me that theoretically Julia would be capable of, you know, getting rid of all the overhead. And so after some exploring, I did realize that it could, which was, wow, you know. Uh, but yeah, initially we didn't, uh, we didn't know that. Yeah, short, short last question. Okay, so you brought some of the genericity of Gloss to, to Julia. Have you thought that maybe even just for the performance comparison to bring those, those, um, this, this uh, compilation model from Julia? To gloss just with a with a, a sub kind of, of generic function and see how that performs. Right. Okay. So the question is if uh, if I thought about uh, you know bringing this Julia compilation model to class. I didn't think about that. No. Uh, <laughs> my my priority was uh, to finish my master thesis. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. But it, it seems like a very interesting idea actually. Instead of uh, you know de uh, developing the mob from the ground up in Julia. Well, it seems like a, a good thing, actually. I don't know. Maybe, maybe if I try to go back to academia, or maybe if one wants to uh, do this, be my guest. Yeah, it seems like a very awesome idea. Yeah. Okay. Now we get some information for lunch. And well, thank, thank you again. Yes, thank you.